Welcome to the IdealNet webinar podcast on Enterprise User Experience Management for Life Sciences. This session will be recorded and available on YouTube, the www.noaa.com website, and the www.idealnetinc.com website. Our sponsors today are NOAA Software, a leader in enterprise user experience management or monitoring. And our presenter is Mr. Chris Biddle, Chief Executive Officer of IdealNet. Please submit questions to mzuckerman at noaa.com and we'll forward them to our team and process them as best we can. Our attendance will be very heavy today, so we'll do the best to answer your questions at the end of the session. We have a worldwide audience, so special thanks to our guests from Japan, Asia, and even Russia for attending this session on U.S. time in the Eastern Time Zone. So I'd like to introduce our guest presenter, Mr. Chris Biddle. Chris Biddle, CEO of IdealNet, founded the company as Ideal Systems in 1994. Uh, IdealNet today is a trusted provider of expert business and technical services, as well as enterprise software, and s provides this capability to the life sciences industry in multiple areas to include contract management, Medicaid, government pricing, sales and marketing, and data warehousing. Chris and his team have a strong working knowledge of these systems as they exist in leading pharmaceutical, medical device, and healthcare distribution companies, and has clients amongst major pharmaceutical manufacturers such as AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson, Merck, Novartis, Pfizer, Sanofi, Aventis, Teva, and Wyeth. IdealNet has also developed software products which are sold by leading software providers to the life sciences industry. In 2006, Ideal Systems sold key software products and related assets to GHX, otherwise known as the Global Healthcare Exchange. Today, core technology developed by IdealNet Incorporated has been licensed to dozens of top 100 pharmaceutical companies through these relationships and more. Chris has authored numerous papers, articles, and book chapters on business and technology topics. He has also spoken for many years at selected industry conferences across the United States and the world. Chris earned his bachelor's bachelor's degree in mathematics from Ursinus College and holds graduate degrees in mathematics and finance from Trinity College and the Wharton School at University of PA. With that, I'd like to welcome our guest speaker today, Chris Biddle. And thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction, Mike, and welcome everybody to this WebEx. And we're going to talk today, as you can see in this introductory slide, about the enterprise user experience management for life sciences. And the agenda today is uh, the Ideal Net Inc. overview. Uh, Mike gave a kind introduction, which essentially gave uh, a good deal of background on the company. Um, just quickly, we do a variety of high-level consulting for all life sciences companies, and we've done work with all of the top ten pharmas with biotechs, med device, etc. Now, enterprise user experience, we're going to cover the state of the life sciences market itself uh, outside of uh, enterprise user uh, experience management to talk about the types of uh, issues and, and stressors that are going on in the market that can be assisted by this solution. We'll talk about the application performance management market and then the user experience management, and we'll compare and contrast those. And we'll go through some use cases for this entire situation in life sciences specifically. And then we'll conclude with some summary findings. We'll talk about the leading vendors and vendor focus, and we'll open it up for questions and discussion. So let's dive in with the state of life sciences market. And again, forgive me if many of the attendees, of course, are quite familiar with this, but we'll review. Uh, legislative burdens in any market worldwide continue to get heavier and heavier, and penalties continue to grow in response to that, and legislative burdens, of course, generally focus around compliance to laws within a particular jurisdiction or across boundaries. And also there are stressors in terms of this situation here, uh, U.S. companies need to acquire new drugs, uh, it's, it's no longer feasible in every case to afford to develop them. As you can see, the average there is one to one and a half billion dollars to bring a new drug to market. And this, again, related to the number one bullet as well, legislative burdens on that in terms of the uh, Federal uh, Food and Drug Administration, FDA in the U.S., and uh, regulations around clinical trials and preclinical trials and so on. 
international generics companies are continuing to fund their own R&D, and also, uh, in many cases, they're contracting with other firms and outsourcing the R&D as well. And the information technology infrastructure continues to become more and more complex. You've got redundant data, virtualized data, and it's monitored more than ever before, both internally and externally, in terms of external entity audits, whether they're private companies or government or combinations. At the same time, human-related processes are managed the same way they were 10, even 20 years ago. So obviously there's a clear area there for improvement to relieve some of the stressors above. So technology trends in life sciences, most uh, companies in this market, and again this includes pharmaceuticals, biotech, medical device, and other areas in the supply chain, Mature companies have an enormous amount of software. They have very specialized applications and vertical business processes. And in many cases, they therefore don't have any kind of off-the-shelf software that they can just go out and buy. In some cases, they can buy a piece of software, but it still requires a great deal of custom work after the purchase. And in other cases, there's no software available at all, and they have to build it from scratch. Movement to the cloud is slow or non-existent in some cases, and this is also because of these custom pieces of software, long established infrastructure, and at the same time also a, somewhat of a fear or reticence to move to the cloud in the case of the worries about compliance and the data not being completely under the control of the internal IT group at the company. SAP is in over 90% of the top 200 pharmaceutical companies. So in terms of some standardization, that at least exists. There are 20,000 seats to over 75,000 spread across all these companies. And in the near future, 75 to 90% of those customers will additionally move to the new SAP platform, HANA, which represents a very, very high performance database backbone in memory processing for extreme speed and reliability. And tremendously complex integration goes on between supply chain activities and the movement of products. So this is with complying with government programs wherever they are internationally, uh, incentive programs which can include chargebacks, rebates, and other incentives, and adjudicating all of that between multiple technology platforms and between multiple trading partners. Mobility offers a strong value prop for doctors, and, and this is a case where more and more, both from a government regulatory standpoint, insisting that patient records be digitized and so forth, but also for the ability to reach the end position in terms of improving the prospects for your company's product and the correct uh, information about the product being at the fingertips of the doctor at the most appropriate time. And 50% of the largest pharma companies in the world have licensed what is called enterprise class user experience management. And we will talk about what that term means and its full definition shortly. So first let's start with the application performance management market. This is a legacy market. And this actually uh, currently generates over $2 billion per year. It's focused on the performance of software and infrastructure. So this is purely technology performance management, and that's uh, on servers or end-user PCs, laptops, etc. You're talking about the performance of the processors, the storage, the data, the networks, the individual applications, and then the security around all of those. These uh, solutions uh, include dashboards. Uh, these are essentially uh, performance dashboards with alerts. Uh, outlier alerts and so forth, uh, manual implementations are often essential because there, there, while there are some small amount of out-of-the-box alerts, generally there's a universe of specific areas where an individual company must focus on and these vendors provide scripting for uh, the companies during installation to be able to create targeted alerts in those areas. The scale of capability, again, it's simplest to just scripted alerts um, when you're running out of disk space, when they have a slow performance in one particular node, et cetera. And 
basic dashboards, which are either proprietary technology to the solution, or they may be BI-based and they have some integration with um, and a BI tool such as uh, Cognizant Prompt or Business Objects. And some of these applications now do deliver additional core analytics that allow you to drill down through the dashboards into underlying trends over time. User experience management, however, this is, uh, first of all, analysts are, uh, some of them include user experience management in the application performance management under the same umbrella. Uh, $100 million segment, it's about 5% of the total market if you include it with application performance, but other analysts view it as its own separate space because of the different approaches and the new and innovative layer that it adds, which application performance doesn't address and never has. Our perspective in terms of this is, is uh, falls into a couple of areas. One is this is a much uh, newer market than uh, the APM market is itself, uh, and as a result, uh, the existing product solutions out there, uh, the variation between them is quite extensive because it's a new market that hasn't settled into some particular model. And the most important thing to customers when looking to really take advantage of this uh, solution is, does a particular product support the use case that you need to solve? And this may be one or more use cases. And what's the potential for ROI, which of course is ever more important uh, financially speaking for any company when making any kind of purchase, significant or not. So what's the market segmentation? Well, essentially, there are three primary levels, and as you can see, as we build the pyramid, we'll discuss what those are. Uh, we're the first firm that we're aware of that's actually split out the market this way. And one of the reasons why this uh, segmentation is important now is the introduction of user experience management beyond what the uh, APM market itself already addressed. An enterprise class really addresses a, a new area, as I mentioned, addresses high value unique use cases, and it's specifically attuned to the actual user proficiency in any given application that flows through the system. And as you can see, if we go bottom to top, and we'll talk about this a couple of times here, the three levels of this market are the basic level, the scripted approach, which is the, the most mature application, uh, monitoring area, then advanced where some vendors have added a desktop agent that does capture some performance of end user area, but strictly on the IT side, again, the technology side only. And finally, enterprise, which takes it to a new level that we'll talk about. So why is it important? Well, it's often critical to measure transactions end to end. So that includes not only the IT, but the network traffic from the source to, to the end user and the overhead of all that at every level of every step of the way to understand understand the true capability and where significant improvement can be done. And measurements up until this point, before the uh, existence of the UEM market, have been essentially simulated, robotic, or synthetic, um, the estimates, etc., that occur, and they're all strictly, again, a technology-based approach. And this is a core part of state of the art that you see in the level two and three functional support di diagnosis tools and an adjunct to help arbitrate problems with service level agreements. But any level of the pyramid here is also feeds into the utilization of both internal and external service level agreements to try to improve the entire process and also decide when changes are needed, whether it's in the topography of network hardware, software, or some other business process. So why is this user experience management important versus the entire pyramid? Actual user measurements from a the desktop, they address a far larger value prop. So we'll, we'll continue to talk in a little more detail of the differentiator for this. So it's not just how the software performs, it's how the user is moving through the software and where improvements could be done there in terms of the work process of efficiency, speed, correction for compliance, etc. Desktop agents, which are in the advanced level, are more precise than the basic 
activity within application performance management because they also monitor the software on the desktop versus only the network and the server area. The data has a far broader capability to deliver ROI against specialized solution scenarios because it is looking at every different performance of all the software, even at the end user area. User performance and user proficiency, however, add the potential for millions in ROI because that's the question and in a variety of use cases, and we'll talk about some ex specific examples shortly, but use cases that determine the true performance both financially and in terms of satisfaction, customer satisfaction, ability to close new business, help desk performance, etc. How the users move through the system and perform in the system and with the system is very important. What are the platforms that have to be addressed? Well, essentially it covers the full gamut. The network itself, the data storage, thin client scenarios. Often companies use products such as Citrix to have a window into uh, another server somewhere else and run uh, software in that environment. Uh, client server, there's still many existing legacy client server applications out there that are in multiple two tiers, three tiers, as the terminology was at that time. Uh, Web-based, of course, is ubiquitous everywhere, both internet and intranet, internal. Windows applications, they're still, of course, uh, throughout all organizations. And mobile devices, more recently, there's, a, there's an exploding use of mobile devices, which includes not only phones, but also tablet-based devices. And right now, most of these are being utilized, uh, pushing data out to reports and alerts, but over time, they're going to become more interactive in both directions. And of course, your in-house data center and the performance there, which is the hub and backbone of most of the items above. Third-party cloud. Again, there's been some slow movement in life sciences for the cloud, but it is picking up steam. And the more secure the cloud becomes and the, the higher the performance, the more cost-effective it becomes to, to migrate certain data and, and certain applications to that paradigm. So an application's mix, where do you need to focus? In a typical large life science company, you can have many hundreds of applications, 500 to 800 of them. And then possibly a thousand or more in various states of storage or disrepair. And in this case, uh, in life sciences in particular, we turn to the compliance area when an application goes offline or it's a legacy application, company is often required to maintain that data of inavailability for a certain number of legislated years for audit purposes or the possibility of responding to a legal request, etc. So they still have to be taken into account. So those numbers are fairly overwhelming in terms of trying to get a total picture and when you're looking at ROI, what you really want to do is try to see where you're going to get the most return on that investment bang for the buck, if you will. So 10 to 20 major enterprise applications really receive 90% or more of all funding and staffing resources traditionally. These include the core business applications of ERP, Enterprise Resource Plan. That's like SAP and Oracle, et cetera. Financials. CRM, your customer relationship management, your HR, that's human resources, BI, business intelligence, compliance specific applications, and these are very industry specific. And then your uh, incentive and, and, and uh, supply chain applications, which include your buildbacks, chargebacks, rebates, and so forth. So obviously that allows you to decide that focusing on those top 10 to 20 is clearly going to give the greatest ROI for risk reduction and compliance best practice, and, uh, and that's very important to know up front. Segmentation, uh, basic UEM, you've got, uh, you've got alerts, you've got SMS, you know, messages going out, uh, even to some cell phones or pagers. Uh, you've got to have that. You have to be able to respond to uh, what could be an emergency situation in real time. Uh, Pre-packaged reports are always included in these particular solutions. And again, this is the basic tier of the pyramid now we're talking about. 
creating custom reports is often difficult uh, because it's, uh, many of these solutions are, in fact, proprietary architecture, and they do not all provide the capability to see inside their data structures. Designated transactions exist, but the user generally has to script specific types of alerts and transactions based on their infrastructure, their IT specific, what technologies do they have, what software do they have, what database do they have. Custom transactions, there's really no inherent support, again, for the same reason that these are closed architecture systems they have been around a long time. Measurement point, usually it's uh, you, there are measurements on the server uh, or some simulated and robotic types of measurements for the network traffic going back and forth between the server and all the users. And the domains, again, it's performance of the infrastructure. So this is really the technology piece of, of the puzzle. Now, moving to advanced UEM, which incorporates all those things, but also adds additional user level by the implementation of the desktop agent on the end user's machine, whether it's PC, workstation, laptop. Uh, these Desktop agents will record some IT performance related to that end machine as it moves data to and from the, uh, the servers and the network deposit. When we reach uh, a next level enterprise class, we're really taking it beyond the technology. This is where the solution actually can gauge the performance and proficiency of user execution within any application that's uh, plugged into this architecture and determine all kinds of interesting statistics that can be used to improve how a user moves through a system, can, can be used to improve how the system itself is set up, uh, to feed into changes to the actual underlying software, etc. So let's look at some use cases. Basic, we tie transactions to alerts. Uh, there's instrument-specific instrument, instrument specific transaction, which again is specific technologies for the network, the database, uh, the storage, etc. Advanced level, we're starting to understand some specific performance by the user in terms of the, how the PC is being used, for example. And that does assist in getting more towards service level agreements if data is moving slowly through the network and not refreshing on the PC quickly enough, for example. Enterprise level, we really get into more detail and, and more areas that can be brought into the mix in terms of making an impact. You can change user education and training based on how they're using the system and, and things that they may be doing less efficiently because they, they simply don't have the knowledge yet. Uh, you can provide visibility to all this, all the way up to the CIO of an organization. You can optimize help desk, the same thing in terms of how quickly help desk uh, people are able to respond to their queries in a variety of areas. And you can ensure more best process compliant by tracking how users move through systems and the fact that they are complying with all the uh, business process that's required in the company. So here's one high value use case, education and training. Uh, major enterprise applications require ongoing training uh, they have hundreds and hundreds of modules and screens and constantly are being improved and updated, upgraded, uh, so users are continually having to learn and relearn. Targeting can become difficult in this in terms of how you train uh, other than generic education mechanisms or using an outsourced company for training. Uh, they'll have a curriculum which handles maybe 80% of items, but that additional 20% could be the make or break for your organization. So being able to measure before, during, and after, right now it's marginal. But understanding the relative merits of alternative training technology. So this is training, you know, remote training, in-classroom training, computer-aided training, etc. And of course, understanding the team, the specific dynamics of the users. You can identify, using the technology, you can often identify 10% or so of best uh, Team members, they become subject matter experts in particular enterprise applications, and then they can mentor others and bring them up to that level. 
segment of users, you can identify the segment of users that might need some remediation in one way or the other, additional training or mentoring, as I mentioned there, with, uh, with the subject matter experts, et cetera. Now, here's another high-value use case, a CIO dashboard. And if we look at this, we're talking about vendor-specific log files in the past had to be parsed by hand with no real analytics. Like a pre-existing technology in this area had some rudimentary dashboarding, but then data stored all over the place in the network that was unavailable for examination. Define true service level agreements with less contention, understanding the gap between performance perceptions and reality, and a true view of enterprise performance. And this type of dashboard, of course, can provide segmentation across different areas in the business, could be divisional, could be user groups, could be technology, what, which areas of systems, and then the ability to drill down through all of them and sort by high performance, low performance, by software in terms of performance, by network performance, or by individual user groups. And it gives a true cost, therefore, the, of any kind of user error or omission. And that allows you to target whether it's an improvement in training or uh, division of responsibilities or uh, which type of software is being utilized for particular tasks. You can resolve problems for which known solutions have been beyond reach in the past because there was no visibility to them. And again, because a lot of this data was never available before in any kind of usable, readable format, sitting in database log files and so forth, the CIO has never seen some of this data before, has never been able to connect to the entire enterprise at this level ever before. So here's another high use case that we mentioned briefly before, help desk optimization. You can improve the existing process, reducing effort to understand exactly what's wrong, having fewer phone calls, less investigation time, lower call times, and a very strong ROI. So there are different ways that this improves the process. One is to improve the process by reducing calls by determining how Education can be done better on, on the, at the end user level or setting up um, parameters, defaults within the software itself. You can also improve the existing process of help desk itself, by the way. And proactive, you can see clusters of errors, you can understand the severity and impact. So you can do all kinds of trending based on that because of the level of data points that are provided by the And now best process and compliance, and you'll forgive me, you noticed the, uh, the picture there of the Terminator. You'd have to be familiar with those movies to understand the full reference here, just to interject a bit of humor. But um, audit and abbreviated version of workflow throughout any transaction, you've got to assess compliance practice versus everything else. So <clears throat> in terms of uh, the U.S. market, pharma, one regulation, for example, is called government pricing, and that's where the companies must provide and prove that they provide the lowest price on particular products with to the government agencies where required as opposed to any commercial entity. And there are stiff penalties and fees if this is not adhered to. And uh, as we might say in the industry, just like the Terminator, uh, this entity, it has no mercy, no understanding, and it won't stop until it gets you. So obviously, this makes compliance crucial. So understanding these problems as before to remediate the training, again, alternatives with the penalties are, are just ridiculously expensive. And these penalties are hundreds of millions, now even billions of U.S. dollars. So user experience management allows you to go down to individual field-level monitoring, which is phenomenal. So on a, on a screen or a page in an application, this software can track the user's movement through fields, how they're using it, what the data is that they're entering, and possibly more important, the omissions of the data that they should be entering to remain compliant at all. So summary and findings, let's take a look at that. And we're leading vendors. First of all, there's a huge opportunity in using these technologies uh, within all areas of life sciences. Here we cite the 200 top pharmaceutical, top 50 med device, 
hospital systems, health insurance, and also any entity within the supply chain, which could include distribution mechanisms such as wholesalers uh, and so forth, and managed care entities. The solution has rapid implementation, which of course is always a plus, um, with, with uh, low levels of customization required. Minimal risk, because these are monitoring mechanisms, they report on things, but they are generally non-invasive in any way to back-end systems, and they are designed so that they themselves do not adversely affect any performance uh, in the IT infrastructure. And the leading vendors there, you can see the basic has been around for some time. It's covered by most of the household names that you see on the left. Uh, advanced UE, UEM, there's a, there are a couple of vendors, one mentioned here, Eternity, that we've seen it has a desktop uh, agent, again, from the IT side. And now Enterprise Class, which is much more recent and sophisticated, and NOAA is the vendor we're focused on there, providing just a tremendous level of ROI and, and ability to really capture everything from the user performance perspective. And that's our vendor focus here when we're talking about that. We think that you really need to take a close look at NOAA software. It's a market visionary, this company, in developing segment of user experience management, and their view of overall direction set them apart. They really have a vision, and they have so far performed against that vision uh, in a timely basis. They have a module already, UPM for SAP and also for Oracle Siebel. So clearly that's a, a powerful recommendation, especially considering the ubiquity ubiquitous use of SAP within life sciences. And they have a strong customer base. They have several hundred licensees, a global reference base around the world. They also have a formal relationship of major channel through SAP, which is always a plus. Other unannounced and potentially powerful channel relationships, so these things are the company has, uh, has mentioned, are being inked now, and so this product is really going to explode. Unique data fuels the four enterprise class use cases. You get user error information, system error, and then the most amazing thing is that user workflow with an analytics front end to see how users are moving through the technology. And finally, here are just a few publications that uh, I've done in the life sciences area. These are all available on our website for download if you're interested. 